This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview, the third in my trilogy on truth, philosopher, science, Philip Kitcher is my guest and the conversation will begin in a moment. Philip Kitcher is my guest. We will be talking about the subject of truth in science and out of science. How can truth be known? and so forth. Uh, so let me just ask you, Philip, uh, if you could take a couple of minutes, uh, tell a little bit of background about who you are, what you've written about the subject of truth, why it interests you. Well, I'm a philosopher of science, although I began my career, my intellectual career, as an undergraduate, as a mathematician at Cambridge University in England, uh, where I was an undergraduate. Um, and I then migrated into the history and philosophy of science, which has occupied me for a large part of my life, although I've become uh, very interested recently in a wide variety of questions about the role of science in society, about uh, science and politics, science and religion, and those have led me into issues of ethics and values more generally, and into a more general approach to philosophical questions in line with American pragmatism. Um, so I'm, so I'm sort of a bit of an intellectual nomad. I've wandered around the, uh, in the intellectual landscape. I've spent a lot of time thinking about mathematics, where I began. I spent a lot of time thinking about biology. And I've recently, with the uh, distinguished scholar Evelyn Fox Keller, co-authored a book on climate change. So I'm interested in a variety of sciences. And above all, I'm very interested in truth and getting straight about truth. Well, let me uh, start with mathematics, and uh, I've mentioned this in other shows when I've had scientists or mathematicians talking about physics and stuff, and uh, I think it's a good place to start regarding truth because there are really two views of mathematics. One is the view that mathematics is not only truth, but the underlying reality of everything, uh, whereas I personally look at mathematics as a language that describes reality. Uh, uh, mathematics is no more reality than English is reality. Uh, so what is your take as someone who started in mathematics? Is mathematics really uh, an, you know, a manifestation of truth, or is mathematics simply a way to get at truth? I think of mathematics as a set of tools. And those tools are languages that mathematicians construct that can be applied to various aspects of reality in various ways. So mathematical truth, for me, is simply a way of designating those particular kinds of languages that seem for various reasons to prove useful to us. And the uses can be quite various. Uh, I think most early mathematics grew out of attempts to come to terms with uh, things we do and uh, structures we could find or make in the physical world. That's what arithmetic and, and geometry are basically for. Um, the calculus was an attempt really to understand geometrical problems more deeply and to undertake uh, problems of motion. And somewhere in the 16th or 17th century, the intellectual community decided to give mathematicians a license to make up their own languages. And they did so as uh, in response to all sorts of things, the needs of the physical sciences, um, the needs of mathematics itself to try to answer questions that hadn't previously been answered, uh, things they happened to find interesting or aesthetically pleasing or just being fun. I think mathematics is a motley of languages and those languages have very, very different intellectual functions. But what drives mathematics from the beginning is the thought that some of these languages can sometimes be used for um, purposes in other forms of inquiry, most particularly in the physical sciences, but also increasingly in the social, social sciences. Um, I think one of the reasons that we live in a society, at least here in America, that is, I guess we'll call scientifically illiterate, some people use, is that oftentimes words that mean one thing in daily life mean something quite different in science. To give two examples, uh, the word theory. When people colloquially use the word theory, they're talking about a premise or a hypothesis, but a scientific theory is something quite different. When we talk about the theory of evolution, people will say, oh, that's just the theory, as if a theory is something easily dismissed. And another example would be, I know, for example, I, I've talked with some physicists about the double slit experiment, and they talk about multiverses and whatnot. And I said, I said, what you're really talking about, though, is potential universes. That's some, that word potential there means just what it 
is supposed to mean. It's not real, but it's a possible thing. Uh, do you think that when we talk about scientific truth, we are talking about something fundamentally different than colloquial truth? Actually, no. No? Uh, I, think, I think factual truth uh, runs the same whether we're talking about tables and chairs or itches or um, uh, recordings of music and when we're talking about quarks and when we're talking about cells and genes and the evolutionary process and the structure of what's going on in the climate. Um, I think scientific truth is different from mathematical truth. But I want to start by going back to where you began, which is with this word theory. Uh, when scientists talk about something being a theory, they typically have in mind the idea that it's a large encompassing structure that can bind together a whole lot of truths about some aspect of the world. So we have the theory of the gene or the theory of heredity, we have the theory of evolution, we have the theory of the chemical bond. And none of these are regarded as particularly um, conjectural or speculative or in uh, popular parlance uncertain. They're all regarded as well established. And when people, ordinary people, use the term theory, they often use it, as you said, in contrast to fact. Oh, well, that's only a theory. Now, some theories are conjectural, but many theories are not. And so we have things like the theory of relativity, the theory of evolution, which are all extremely well supported by masses of evidence. And there should be no more uncertainty about um, many aspects of the theory of evolution uh, as there are about the, flat, the, 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 the spherical character of the Earth. I mean, thinking that uh, the Earth is flat is a bit outmoded, and thinking of the Earth as not having a very long history of life on it in which species have evolved um, is a bit like thinking the Earth is flat. Um, yeah, you mentioned the two words, relativity and uncertainty, that also, I think, uh, get into why people misconstrue things regarding truth. Uh, uh, Einstein's theory, both of general uh, relativity and uh, 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 what not, uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, people use this to sort of justify why they will, let's say, uh, if some argument happens between two people or there's a traffic accident uh, and someone is clearly guilty but they won't accept responsibility, they'll, they'll try to invoke uncertainty or relativity. Um, and then they look at something like the idea of qualia in science, that there are things that, you know, we may not ever be able to determine uh, if your red is the same as my red, as the same as 10 other people's idea of what red is. Do you think that uh, there's this uh, uh, appropriation of scientific terms by into the ma by filtered by the mass media into into a society that people latch on to to justify things that they know are not so? Well, I think we're living through a time which talk, talk about truth has become very entangled. Uh, the talk about alternative facts is, um, is, a, is a form of relativism, and that relativism is, as you, I think, indicated, sometimes associated with uh, something respectable, like Einstein's account of relativity. Um, there are going to be many, 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 many truths that we are unlikely ever to be able to discover. I mean, just think of something very mundane. You know, how many footsteps did Julius Caesar take during the course of his lifetime? Yeah. I doubt we're ever going to answer that question. I mean, and why would we want to know it, really, you know? Right, exactly. It's not a particularly interesting question to ask. Um, you know, exactly how many blades of grass were destroyed by, Viet by Agent Orange during the Vietnam War? I mean, p possibly slightly more interesting than Julius Caesar's footsteps, but not much. Yeah. Uh, and those are the sorts of things I think we we're never going to have access to. Given the theory of relativity, we know that there are going to be um, events that from which we're causally disconnected, and it's not obvious how we would ever find out things about those. So there are all sorts of truths that we aren't ever going to be able to discover. But when a um, traffic accident occurs, to use your example, we can sometimes quite correctly and determinatively assign the blame. And I, I think most people would be very unwilling to grant that in every criminal case, there are 
really two sides of the matter and it's all relative. Most people, even those who sometimes say, well, I have my facts and you have your facts, are really quite unwilling to uh, um, sort of say on every single criminal verdict, well, it could have gone the other way, you just have to see it from another point of view. They're quite unwilling to say of their own um, bodily conditions when they're healthy and when they're sick. Well, there are two ways to look at that. You know, you, you might think I'm sick, I don't think I'm sick. They think there's a determinate truth about the matter. And I think there's this objective pull that we have in everyday life and in the sciences. And the fact that we sometimes can't find things out or can't get, can't get the kind of evidence that makes us comfortable settling a question doesn't mean that relativism thrives across the board and there's always an alternative. Sometimes uh, the evidence is indecisive and we can't really decide. But a lot of the time, we can. Yeah, you, we speak, you're speaking about, um, uh, you know, false facts and this Donald Trumpian uh, notion of uh, fake news, uh, real truth, etc. Uh, that brings to mind the idea of hierarchies in truth. And uh, science often is laid in hierarchies when you talk about Caesar's footsteps of the grass blades uh, ruined by Agent Orange. Uh, this might be, you know, considered trivia, uh, but truths such as, uh, was there a Big Bang? Was there something before a Big Bang? Did the Big Bang happen? What really killed off the dinosaurs? And even to say on a sociological level, say, well, was there really a Jack the Ripper and who was it? Uh, those would seem to be a little less trivial than some of these other things. Uh, the Jack the Ripper thing would be less important, clearly, than what killed off the dinosaurs. Um, uh, so do, do you ac accept the idea that there are also hierarchies of truths, that there are trivial truths, that there are, you know, uh, bold, you know, flashing neon lettered truths? Well, let's put it this way. There are some things of which we are pretty certain. That doesn't mean that we can be absolutely certain about them, engrave them in stone. I mean, one of the great morals of the history of science um, is that even theories and laws that seem uh, extremely powerful uh, can be displaced, as Newton's laws were displaced by Einstein's. Um, now, what happens in those cases is that retrospectively we can look back and say, well, Newton didn't get it quite right. Yeah. And in some ways, Newton's uh, way of conceiving the universe needed to be adjusted. But there was a lot of truth in what Newton said. Yeah. Now, that should lead us to say, well, we never reach absolute, complete certainty. But yeah. sometimes we get pretty good evidence, pretty strong evidence for thinking that some things are true. And sometimes we have much less evidence. I certainly think we have a much firmer grasp on um, some aspects of the theory of evolution and, some, and many aspects of the theory of heredity, we have about quite ordinary things in our daily lives. So we should be as comfortable in asserting the principles and claims about the history of life or about the, the ways in which characteristics get inherited as we are about the qualities of the tea or coffee we drink and, uh, um, you know, our friends, our friends' behavior, etc., etc., etc. Now that's one dimension. There's a certainty, a lesser certainty dimension. There are some things that are quite conjectural. I mean, economists um, have some pretty good views about some aspects of the economy, but about many things, they they have to say, well, the, the evidence seems to be in favor of of, of this kind of, uh, of of approach, but we can't really be terribly certain about it. Uh, the social sciences, it seems to me, have uh, often cases in which there are very important things that we would like to know, on which we have some evidence, but not entirely conclusive evidence. Now, so the, the, the certainty, the relative certainty dimension is one dimension. The other dimension is the significance. I mean, some things are extremely significant for, for us. I mean, take uh, my favorite example of this is the way in which the climate is responding to our emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, if we could arrive at clear and definite and certain predictions about that, we would have a much 
often the sense of I what to do. We know some things. We know that we are responsible for climate change. We know that it's likely to be very dangerous within the next century. But we would like to know exactly what the threats are. Yeah. And we can't tell them. Now, there's, there's a case in which something is highly significant. Some parts of it are very certain, and some parts of it are less certain. Yeah. There are some things, as you saw, that are much less important for us, and some things that are absolutely trivial, like my example of Julius Caesar's footsteps. It's hard to think of anybody seriously wanting to know the answer to that question. Mm. It's very easy to think that people might like to know the answer to questions about what exactly goes on in Alzheimer's disease, for example. That's mm. a really important question. And we've got some clues about it, but not a great deal of certainty. So you can think of the things that we try to, know, to uh, investigate as spread out in two dimensions. They're more or less significant. And our evidence for them is more or less, uh, sometimes we're really lucky, we get really significant knowledge about the molecular basis of various kinds of disease. Well, that's important for us, and the evidence is very good. We're justifiably certain about those things. Sometimes there are things that are very important for us, um, like exactly where the climate change threats are going to strike, and we know some things, but we don't know as much as we'd like to. So could think of all the things that, 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 that all the things we could say is spread out on this two-dimensional space. Lots of trivial stuff, um, you know, down at one end of the axis. Lots of important stuff uh, at the other end of the axis, and relative great certainty for each of these, uh, each of the claims that we might make. Yeah, um, climate change is a good example. Uh, I think because the people who deny it clearly have a political axe to grind. Yet, by the same token. Uh, there is there probably are some people who genuinely uh, are skeptical of the scientific position and uh, uh, for, uh, just to give you an example it's often stated with climate change that uh, if you look at the beginning of the industrial revolutions and you look at the emissions uh, per cubic ton or whatever into the atmosphere that the temperatures seem to go up in pretty good unison accord with with that for the last couple of centuries but by the same token the same people who uh, are supporters of uh, uh, global warming, uh, who generally are scientists who are liberal-minded, will look at something that has a similar pattern. For example, say the expansion of uh, Native American ancestors into the Americas and then the subsequent extinction of the megafauna in North America and South America then being wiped out within usually a century or two of the arrival of mankind often. Uh, there, it's not as politically correct to support the case that uh, it was the Native American ancestors that wiped out the megafauna. So people who are outside looking at the climate change, people will say, well, you're trying to use obvious science to support your thing here uh, with climate change, but it seems just as obvious that Native American ancestors killed off megafauna if you look at a, a, the earliest arrival of mankind and then the extinction of certain animals. So do you think that there is some basis of good criticism towards science in the way it's been foisting truth in certain things and maybe not in others? Okay, so this is, a, this is well, you're asking a very complicated question. This is going to take me a little while. Okay, so the first, So the first thing to say is, um, you know, there are quite reasonable concerns about uh, climate change. I mean... You might well say to the scientific community, you guys are making these claims, and if we took them seriously, we would actually have to make um, some rather large changes in our ways of life. We don't want to do that if it's unnecessary. So you've got to really show us strong evidence. And so what scientists do, of course, is they show um, a couple of graphs. Uh, one graph is um, the pattern of temperature, uh, the Earth's mean temperature over, a, say, a 200-year period or a longer period. Um, maybe it's a, a millennium. They show this sort of gentle slope down that happens until you get the Industrial Revolution really get kicking into high gear, and then this sudden sharp uptick. And then they put, perhaps on the same slide, um, a graph of the uh, 
increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide and its equivalents in the atmosphere. So what you've got there is the correlation. Now, a correlation doesn't imply a causal connection. It might be the case that something else is going on. And so it's reasonable for ordinary people to ask the scientific community to rule out other Abilities. You know, could this just be an uh, ordinary sort of variation that's happening because of the, you know, variations in the Earth's orbit or sunspot sun cycles, yeah, or something else? And the climate science community has been incredibly thorough in trying to show that other potential causes don't affect that, right? So that you can't explain these de this correlation in other terms. If you look at patterns of sunspot activity, variations in the Earth's orbit, they just don't fit with the data. And so the, as it were, the last pause left standing is the known mechanism, and this has been known since the end of the 19th century, that there is this greenhouse effect, and the more greenhouse gases you have in the atmosphere, the more pronounced it is. So you've got a known way of, of causing the kind of temperature increase that you see with increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And you've got no other causal explanation of this correlation. That's the structure of the argument. Now, the trouble is, that, you know, it's very difficult for the ordinary person really to get a sense of that. I mean, they get, uh, uh, they get told by people like me what the climate science scientists have done and how they've been very thorough in investigating all these things. But then somebody else will come on Fox News and say, well, they're all politically motivated. They really want to have lots of money for climate science research, etc., etc., etc. So they're doing this um, for purely political reasons. I mean, I think if you think about that hypothesis for a moment, it's absurd. I mean, that's not the way science works. I mean, yes, to be sure, um, you know, major scientists are quite powerful. But they're not mafia bosses. They're not able to sort of coerce an entire community into following their lead. The rewards of some young scientists who blew the whistle on this would be absolutely extraordinary. Um, but it is very hard for the layman to, uh, to, to sort of recognize this. Now, let's turn to your other example. So in the case of the, um, uh, the arrival of the ancestral North Americans and the extinction of the North American megafauna. Again, you've got a correlation. I don't know the extent to which the relevant community has explored alternative possibilities for explanation. But, you know, I mean, it's possible the scientists who are involved in this are concerned by the political implications that they really want to leave no stone unturned before they start accusing a particular group of people of having, uh, you know, eliminated a large number of animals. Now, I mean, actually, when you think about it hard, it's not really so uh, such a terrible accusation to make. Yeah. I mean, what do you expect these guys to do? Yeah. Uh, like, oh, we've got to preserve all of these animals for our, our de descendants. Yeah. I mean. They're facing the needs to eat every day. So, I mean, the issues are, the issues here are complicated. But I do, I, I mean, first of all, you're, you're talking about two different sets of scientists. I mean, you can't, uh, and one set of scientists may be highly politically motivated and the other may not be highly politically motivated. But in the case of climate science, it seems to be pretty clear that they've been remarkably thorough mm. and they've explored the possible alternative causes and they found them wanting. So the only candidate at the end of the day, if I'm being Sherlock Holmes-ish here, right, this is the only, this is the only suspect left. Yeah. The emission of greenhouse gases. And we know that the suspect could have done the dirty deed because, you know, over a century ago, people like John Tingle and Spihare Arrhenius uh, worked out the mathematical physics of the mechanism. Yeah. Um, let me just talk a little bit about sem the semantics of truth. Um, people often use the word truth and the word reality as if they're synonyms. I come from the arts and don't agree with that. For example, uh, the fact that Dan Schneider is interviewing Philip Kitcher about truth via Skype is the baseline reality of this 
actual second as we're doing this, these, these hours so that we're speaking together. Um, but if I state Dan Schneider is interviewing Philip Kitcher about truth via Skype, it is true now. It wasn't true an hour ago. It won't be true an hour from now. To me, truth is always a comment on reality. Does science make that distinction, uh, or is that something that is just the realm of philosophy? Okay, so, so we've now moved into philosophy, and when philosophers think about truth, they think about truth as relationship between ideas or thoughts or sentences or statements and the world. Okay? Many philosophers, ever since Aristotle, have thought about truth as a correspondence between thought and reality. Now, when you, t when you use a, uh, a sentence with a tense in it, like Dan Schneider is now interviewing Philip Kitcher, right. right? Then what we have to do is we can't take that sentence and say there's an enduring religion between that sentence and the world. What we say is at, when uttered at this particular moment in time, right now, that sentence is true. When it's uttered at other moments in time, it will be false. So what actually stands in the truth relation to the world is a, sentence, a tensed sentence uttered at the time. Now, if you make a universal statement, and many scientific statements are universal statements, uh, let's take a, a, a sentence like, uh, all molecules of DNA have the structure of a double helix. Okay, that looks like a universal statement. It looks as though it applies all places, all times. Strictly speaking, it's false because single-stranded DNA. But uh, um, if I said most DNA has the structure of a double helix, um, then what I would be saying would be true across times, and it would always be true. Now, that's the kind of truth that scientists tend to aim for, except when they're talking about particular events. And when they're talking about particular events occurring, um, then, as in ordinary speak, they often make tensed statements, and when what they say is true at a time and not at other times. So that's, that seems to me an important distinction to make. The really tricky question is trying to understand this relationship of correspondence between what we say or what we think and the way the world is. That's, that's, that's where the, the, the hard philosophical work comes in. I mentioned earlier the term qualia, which for those who might not know is... Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. I, yeah. I, I skipped over that. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no problem. I was just going to... Qualia is... is uh, the, what you can recognize and can someone else recognize that in the same way. And that brings to mind the idea of objectivity and subjectivity. And there's, a, there's also a, a philosophical uh, idea, usually related to religion, called ultimism, uh, the ultimate truth, being that, uh, you know, your red may be different than what I would call red. I might call your red mauve, uh, but there is some ultimate truth. Do you think that there really is, or the fact that, that does consciousness actively work upon the cosmos in a sense, uh, that if you are in the cosmos and not outside the cosmos as a god might be, that there really cannot be total objectivity? I don't, I'm not saying I agree with that, but a lot of people have argued that. Well, you're really, you're really touching on something that I think is a deep and important question. And I think that actually the world in which we live and about which we talk is constructed by us, not just physically, but also conceptually. We are creatures with particular kinds of senses, and we are creatures that have a particular long tradition of ways of dividing up and recording our experience. And so we, we are led to group certain things together, to draw boundaries in particular ways. So the computer I'm now looking at um, is, from a microphysical point of view, um, a really peculiar, funny blur of, of 
tiny little things whizzing around. Okay, yeah. um, but I don't see it that way. What I've done, what I do is I impose a boundary around the computer. It's just, it's it's got lines around it that I could draw, and that's a very low level way in which my senses and my thought organizes the world. And it seems to me that what the sciences do is that they constantly look for good and convenient ways for us to organize the world and find order in it so that we can act, so that we can do things, so that we can achieve our goals. And in the evolution of the sciences, new languages emerge, we draw boundaries in different places, and we say new things. And what, what do I think the scientists, sciences look for uh, the kinds of stable things that endure as we uh, as we make progress, introducing more and more order, more control into into the world in which we experience. So I think this is extremely hard. To, uh, when I said the relationship between our thought and reality was difficult to characterize, I think it's in some ways it's the, one of the deepest problems in philosophy philosophical thinking, and it's horrendously complicated. And it's horrendously complicated because we're not really talking about the world from God's eye standpoint. In fact, I think we should abandon the idea of a God's eye standpoint. What we're talking about is the world as we experience it, and that's a very highly worked over and constructed world. I mean, what's happening to your eyes right now as you look into a screen, uh, all six tells us getting all sorts of signals which your brain then puts together yeah. in a particular way. That's not just influenced by your biology, it's also influenced by a long history of culture that has bequeathed to the people who socialized you and who socialized me ways of conceptualizing the experience that you're having. And we continue to do that. And science is a very, very important part of our continuing to do that more effectively and with, as it were, a greater ability to order and organize and control so yeah. that we can achieve our purposes. Yeah, and of course, our experiences also determine what we filter out. I grew up, for example, in New York City and you know, on summer nights when before air conditioning was widely available, you'd hear people screaming into the middle of the night and you'd shut that out. But someone from you know an English countryside might find it impossible to sleep with all those people screaming outside. And so I've learned to filter out certain things you may not have. Um, and that gets me back to the idea about uh, uh, mathematics as a language, because I've often thought, and I've talked with a few other scientists about the idea that... Uh, our sensory perceptions, we have five major senses, and arguably people have argued anywhere from five to a couple of dozen other minor senses. But I could imagine an alien intelligence, perhaps, that would perceive the universe in a wholly different way. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, that things that to us may seem insoluble, maybe once we get quantum computers, it might not be, but to our mortal selves, are insoluble to them would be you know like burping you know it, it, it's like duh and vice versa there are things that we see as bedrock truths that they may not, not have ever thought of do you think that truth then is limited by evolution and how our senses evolved um well i don't think truth is but i think our knowledge is inevitably limited by the the adaptations that we've developed i mean it's, it's, I go back to something that William James, uh, the great American psychologist and philosopher, said in his Principles of Psychology, that the world of the crustacean is different from the world of the human being. Yeah. It's profoundly different. And what you were suggesting yeah. is that the world of the alien might be different from the yeah. world of the human being in having certain kinds of sophistications that our our world lacks. And I would say even it's not might, it, it would seem fundamentally, it would have to be, even just coming from a planet maybe that's going to have a stronger atmosphere or, or a stronger gravity or a lesser gravity. Don't know. Yeah. I, mean, it seems that, I mean, it seems to me the jury's completely out on that. You could say, well, there are 
I mean, this is actually a big debate in yeah. people who think about evolution, about whether um, you inevitably get certain kinds of convergence if yeah. you develop uh, intelligence, say, or you develop locomotion, say, or whether you get, um, you know, radic radical differences. I think, we, I think we don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, and, that, and that, that's, I think, one of the, the things that's a strength of science is being able to say, I don't know or we don't know. Um, and so let me just segue then to the scientific method, because when I was a young boy in science class, you know, we talk about the wheel or the lever or, 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 or whatnot, you know, the simple machines. And to me, though, the most important invention that man ever made was the scientific method, uh, that things have to be provable. And there are things that uh, certainly can't, I, I don't think, be proven. You know, uh, do I really love my wife? Uh, is, you know, uh, uh, is this film really better than that film? Uh, uh, you know, uh, but um, what are your ideas about the scientific method and truth? And do you think that there are things that are beyond the scientific method scope to get to truth? Okay, so I'm going to be I'm 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 going to take issue with a number of things you said. Okay. First, I think I don't think that uh, that the question of whether you love your wife or not is unanswerable, um, and I guess you probably uh, have pretty good evidence that you do. I mean, I'm, 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 this is a charitable reading <laughs> of your relationship, but um, uh, you know, I mean, I. That's the sort of thing about which people always sort of say, well, you know, do I really know? And I think the answer to that is, well, you can have pretty, just as good evidence as this in this domain as you have in other domains. Um, now, you talked about the scientific method. And I think that our temporary situation is that there are a number of sciences and they have a number of different methods. And they're all broadly characterized by you know, the thought that you can, you use mathematics in various ways and you do experiments and you respond in particular ways to um, the results of those experiments. But how exactly you do that varies enormously from science to science. And the, you can say very flabbily and in a very general way that there is this sort of broad thing called the scientific method and involves some of mathematics and experiment. And that's roughly what people like Bacon and Galileo and Descartes and Boyle and the big 17th century inventors of what we tend to call the scientific method would have said. And as their critics pointed out, this is really pretty trivial. It's pretty thin. It doesn't get you very far. And when you actually get into the details psychology, genetics, climate science, different areas of physics, different areas of chemistry, teach different methods to the people who pursue them. Um, the Harvard historian of science, Peter Gallison, has written a lovely book called Experiments End, in which he concentrates on the difficulties that there are in physics, deciding when you've got data that really confirms a hypothesis. This is all very and very tricky. The same goes for climate science, although the methods are different. The same goes for psychology, the methods are different. The same goes for genetics, though the methods are different. So what we've got is a cluster of methods that have been developed for a series of centuries, and those methods are pretty good. How do we know they're pretty good? Well, they tend to yield, if they, when we think we have evidence for something, it tends, first of all, to endure, and it tends to be very effective in action. So take, for example, the conclusions of molecular genetics. They've enabled people to do all kinds of truly remarkable things in the last decade. You know, make organisms to order with all sorts of properties that people have wanted to put together, you know, chimeric flies, um, have some, some genes in some tissues and quite different genes in other tissues, uh, bacteria that can produce uh, useful 
substances for medicines and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, gone are the days when diabetics had to rely on pigs and cows for their insulin. We can do it by churning out insulin from bacterial factories. And this is, re this is really remarkable. And one's inclined to say, this shows that those guys who did all those experiments and amassed the evidence were really onto something in the world. Their uh, conclusions are tested daily by the power of the inventions that they can make in the natural world. So I think of, of us as assembling a cluster of methods that we can use for various scientific purposes. I mean, it's only quite recently that people have uh, recognized the, the importance of uh, randomized controlled trials in certain kinds of medical contexts. Not all medical contexts, but, uh, but quite a lot of them. Randomized controlled trials were a new methodological idea that came up in the 20th century. And that's likely to continue. So we not only in the sciences learn more about nature, but as we learn more about nature, we learn more about how to learn about nature. So the scientific method, as you call it, is this sort of big umbrella that covers a whole bunch of techniques that are constantly being refined and developed further. Yeah. Um, there have always been sort of what I would consider pseudoscientific attempts to get at the truth. The most obvious one to me in society are, are polygraph tests, um, uh, there's a difference between a lie, which to me shows agency in telling an untruth versus an untruth unknowingly passed on. I mentioned earlier, you know, people use the term my truth. And I'm wondering, uh, we are simians and there certainly have been evolutionary benefits that we get from uh, telling untruths. Uh, you know, if I, if I can hide the, the best... Uh, if, if we were monkeys or uh, proto-simians and I can hide where the best uh, stand of trees that give mangoes are, uh, my clan or my my people will uh, be stronger and, and more fit than the next tribe and we'll conquer them. Um, do you think that uh, there is an evolutionary benefit to uh, uh, telling untruths? And if so, how hard is it for society to go against these thousands of generations where telling untruths was beneficial. Okay, so this is again a really complicated issue because um, being honest and sincere on the one hand or being deceptive on the other um, is something that, you know, is in very, is a, it's a special case of cooperative or uncooperative behavior. And it's a remarkable fact about our evolutionary relatives, closest evolutionary relatives, the chimps and the bonobos, um, and us, that we've got certain kinds of limited abilities to identify with the interests and wishes of the organisms like us in the vicinity the members of our local group. And that enables us to get along together a bit of the time. But if we just had to rely on the uh, those cooperative necessities, our social life would be utterly different from what it is. So what comes in on top of that is a real social achievement. And the social achievement is what we call morality. It's the ability to frame rules that can uh, guide us towards more cooperative behavior and prevent us from mucking things up all the time through our own, um, as it were, selfish behavior and thwarting of those around us. And so I've actually advanced an evolutionary account of ethics which sees the importance of things like truth-telling and sharing and not initiating violence, and recognizes that we are psychologically not terribly well equipped to do that by our evolutionary past. But we've made this tremendous cultural invention, which is to bind ourselves by certain kinds of rules and patterns of behavior. And that's made a society for us possible that is immensely larger, complex, and more powerful that is available to our, our 
you know, closest evolutionary relatives. So I want, what I want to say about that is, of course, there are sometimes advantages to deception, but it's even more advantageous to be able to bind yourself and to bind those around you in ways that ensure that correct information gets pooled and so corrupt people can go forward. Yeah. And this actually goes back uh, to, the, to the issue of climate change that we were talking about earlier, because here we're facing a cooperative problem on a scale that we haven't yet attempted really before. It's human cooperation. It's the entire species that we need at this point in order to ward off to all of us, namely the production of an environment in which our descendants will no longer be able to live or no longer be able to live as we have lived. Okay, so are we up to that kind of cooperation? I just hope so. But it certainly wasn't given to us by Mother Nature or the forces of natural selection. If we have it, it's because we can extend our ethical thinking to recognize the need for really global cooperation at this moment. Um, as we head towards the end of this interview, I just have a couple of more major questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, I wanted to talk about the brain, the mind, memory, and its effect on what we perceive as the truth. Um, uh, I have a very darting memory. Uh, I call it sort of a, a fluid memory. Um, uh, you know, convectively, it, things come up, pop up. Other people have, I guess you call file draw memories. They can just pick things out. Um, but my wife is always getting on me for misremembering, especially time. You know, I'll say, oh, that happened about a year and a half ago. She'll say, no, that was seven years ago. And she's usually 99% of the time right. Um, but I've known people, for example, that over time, and I don't know whether they do this willfully or it's just their mind doing it, uh, I may remember an event and other people may remember an event and it may be a serious event, it may be a trivial event. And the people tend to embroider over time. Every time they remember something, they add things. So someone who two years after an event might have remembered two or three things, now 20 or 25 years after an event, they remember a dozen or more things in greater detail. And I, I say to myself, well, that's not, that's, I, I don't believe that's so. Other people will say that didn't happen. But this person will say, no, they remember it clearly. Um, is there something about the chemical or the biological structure of the brain that, you know, makes untruths uh, out of former truths? I mean, do we just do this naturally? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert in this yeah. by any means. But um, some of my friends who are into uh, psychology and neuroscience talk uh, all the time about things like confabulation. Yeah. And it's quite clear that cognitively we we have lots of similarities with one another, but we also differ from one another. People really do have individual differences in the kind the kinds of thinking that they do. That's something that's useful if we think of our principal efforts of finding things out as highly social. So if I mean so you can work with your wife, right? You, you understand where she's more likely to be right, and she understands where you are more likely to be right, and the two of you can gain. You can, as it were, make up for the, your, your cognitive foibles. And as societies, we can do that. I mean, there is this wonderful thing about all of us. Um, we're part of this huge society that has this long tradition, and in this tradition, we've been dividing up what I call the epistemic labor for you know, tens of thousands of years and reporting to one another on things that um, we've observed or we thought. And those things get filtered by the um, by audience for them and they get worked out. And so if we do this well, we'll gain. It's a tremendous and wonderful uh, collaborative and that's why honesty is so important for us. Because if people start interjecting things into that which are deliberate falsehoods, then the whole proceed becomes much more difficult. Um, now, I don't, I don't know how much is genuinely known in, um, in about the sort of the 
the deep, um, the deep structures here. I'm inclined to think that neuroscience is in its infancy, and you know, a, a vaunted talk of the decade of the brain, etc., etc., promises more than it's likely to, to deliver at this stage. And I'm, I always like to think in this context of the state of uh, genetics in the early 20th century. So after Mendel's laws of heredity got rediscovered, many people wanted to go straight off and act of uh, the inherited human diseases and try to understand how those work. And that program got nowhere. But actually a scientist at my university here in Columbia went up to a tiny little room and bred fruit flies and worked out their genetic mechanisms. And that led some decades later to the fabulous molecular medicine that we now have. So I think that sometimes when we think about these the kinds of questions you just raised, we're inclined to jump at them and to think that we can answer them very quickly. And I suspect that what neuroscience needs to, to do is to concentrate on tra practical problems and not try to figure out um, you know, the memory structures that vary in you, your wife, and all of us, but focus on something that is the equivalent of, say, eye color in the fruit fly and proceed from that rather apparently unexciting question to build a basis for answering the questions that at the end of the day we all want to find out the answers to. Uh, I will link to your Columbia University webpage below this video. Let me just ask, since uh, it looks like uh, either it's just come out or it will be coming out, you've written a book uh, uh, called The Seasons After, which I would assume uh, deals with global warming. Uh, Seasons Alter. Oh, I'm sorry. I misread it. Seasons alter. Um, the yeah. seasons alter. Um, so, uh, is that going? Is that the major focus uh, for now in your life? Uh, will you be writing uh, more about truth, say, in a, a further book? What's uh, what are you going to be doing in the next couple of years? I'm, then I'm actually I'm actually at work at the moment on a book tentatively entitled "Progress, Truth, and Values," which will take up some of the questions mm. that you've asked me today. Um, that won't be around for a while, but there are some um, there are some precursors to what I've talked about with you today in a yeah. book of essays I published a few years back called Preludes to Pragmatism. Yeah. And will um, this uh, future book be more anthropologically looking at uh, human no, society? No, this is this is this is my attempt to give a sort of a large philosophical account of um, the kind of concepts of progress of the importance of of understanding progress to the, to the human future and to the ways in which progress and truth connect with one another and the way in which our values and our projects evolve over time. So this is a, um, it's a, so it's a large book, won't be done with it for a long time. The book that I that just published, Evelyn Fox Keller, on climate change, the seasons alter, um, is some of that. It's, uh, it, it, it has in it the general kind of attitude that I've tried to express to you. And it has um, a more detailed arguments for some of the things that I've said in, in our conversation. But uh, I'm planning at the moment to write a lot more time um, I'm planning I'm planning to sort of uh, try to write a large philosophical account of which truth will be at the center. Well, as I said, I will link to your Columbia University page. I want to thank you for spending some time talking about truth with me, Philip Kitcher. Thank you very much, Dan. I've enjoyed it.